an unexceptional Saturday morning spent in Starbucks. That's what it should have been. Me and my boyfriend Sean were doing what we usually do, drinking coffee and gossiping about the latest stuff going on in our silly small town. It was a hot day, possibly the hottest in a long time, when he appeared. I was first to notice him, the tall figure, marching down our high street, like a one-man funeral procession, adorned with old-fashioned clothes, a dusty old black suit, jacket, and hat. He sort of had an Amish look to him. You know, the back-in-time look? He turned his head as if he sensed me watching. My heart nearly stopped when his drawn-back lips grinned a false smile my way. Those features of his, they were withered, drained, and taut, like a cancer patient. He had a crow beak nose, thin and sharp, and his eyes were sunken and drained. Casting a wave my way, he turned and continued walking on. In his wake, the warming rays of the sun turned and ran, being replaced by a shroud of black clouds. Even as it rained heavy, the man's delirious grin never ceased. He smiled at everyone he passed, but they seemed utterly unaware of him or the change in the weather. There was something about that jangly skeleton of a man and his polygripped teeth that were deeply unsettling. It was like a primal feeling, really, sort of like instinct. I looked at him and felt dread. Just as quickly and unannounced as his arrival, he was gone. What are you looking at? Sean asked, seemingly oblivious to the creepy man I had just seen. Uh, the man! The creepy guy in the old-fashioned clothes? I told him. But when I looked back outside, it was a roaring hot day with no sign of rain or the man who brought it with him. Are you going all six cents on me? Do you see dead people? Sean teased. His blue eyes were beaming with amusement. Uh, sh shut up. I laughed as I playfully swatted away his hand from mine. We returned to our regular routine Saturday. But that man, that strange man, lingered in my thoughts, like an ominous black cloud, raining fear and suspicion, drowning out all other thoughts. In the days that followed, strange things started happening. Weird weather, pets and animals running off, or acting strange. The reverend, seemingly vanishing from the face of the earth. And then there were the deaths. At first, it was just a couple of overdoses. Nothing new, every town has its druggies and burnouts. But soon, it wasn't just overdoses. It was accidents, odd occurrences, little slips and falls, which caused people to break their necks, shatter their spines, or even split their skulls. Maggie, the school cook, even accidentally set herself on fire with a chip pan. Sean's dad was the victim of these so-called accidents. He fell from the ladder, despite Sean holding it steady. When it came to the funeral, I tried to be there for Sean as best as I could, but I knew none of my jokes, nor my loving words, could remedy the injury this sudden and unexpected death had caused. When I sat beside my boyfriend, I could see he had been swallowed up by grief. His dad was his best friend, the first person to accept him when he came out, and his absolute champion if anyone dared say anything. So that's what makes what Sean told me all the more strange. You see, before the funeral, Sean had phoned me. He told me that his dad wanted to see him, wanted him to go with him, but I played it off as a dream or grief, or both. I assured Sean that his father would never want him to die, and that this was going to be difficult, but we would get through it together. Alas, my words hadn't seemed to help. The funeral should have been a lovely service. We should have been able to say goodbye and mourn. However, what happened instead was the abrupt appearance of the last person I expected to see. Accompanying the coffin and officiating was the same creepy man I witnessed walking down the street that day at Starbucks. Greetings, I'm Nathaniel, Nathaniel Everett, Reverend Everett. I hope you don't mind, kind people, but my colleague, the Reverend Mills, is not feeling all too well today. And as I was passing through, and I'm an ordained minister, I offered my services he said with a genteel southern accent. The words were soft, warm, and the fluent language of a simple townsfolk. They were perfect for pulling people in. They didn't pull me in, though. I saw him, with his out-of-place old-fashioned clothes and his freakish skeleton frame. I knew he was not good. Imposingly tall, 
He was almost hunched over at the top of his body as he leaned it down to preach to us about life and death. My nervous eyes looked on, concerned with this stranger, but no one else seemed to share my anxiety. In fact, this preacher man was welcomed as a stand-in priest, as if this was completely normal and regular. I wanted to say something, sensing that this was odd, to say the least. But then, that porcelain white smile, dentured smile of his, fell upon me, ushering my lips to silence. Parading around and speaking old parables, the preacher gave the grand performance. With his door-to-door -door good news-like persona, he offered all salvation and insight into the beyond, as if he could never know such things. He offered us assurances that Sean's father would live on in the afterlife, that he was not finished, and they too could and would one day meet again. Open your hearts to those you have lost. Remember them, picture them, hold them in your mind, and they will return to you, he smirked with a sinister about him. As soon as the service was over, I wanted to get out of there immediately, but Sean stayed. He wanted a little bit more time with his father, and I understood. I told him I'd meet him back at his house, where the rest of the attendees were going to drink and eat and celebrate the life of Sean's dad. He assured me that he would follow soon after, but he never did. As I left the church, I turned back for a moment and saw the preacher lay his hand upon Sean's shoulder and smile my way. I should have known what that smile meant, but I didn't. I was foolish and afraid. Time passed and it grew dark with no sign of Sean returning home. His mother, Alice, asked if I had seen Sean, to which I answered, no, not since the church. Concerned for his well-being, I returned there, fueled by love, not by bravery. I powered up the hilltop, past the gravestones and the markers, but stopped for a second, halted by fear once more. Before I even stepped foot in the building, there was a sense of foreboding. Standing atop the hill, the small whitewashed structure that I had been baptized in appeared gloomy and dim. Its spire-like bell tower invaded by flocks of crows and its windows were darkened, not at all welcoming. Swallowing my fear inside, I marched on. I tried to open the church doors and to my surprise, they were not locked up. This was odd. Reverend Mills always made sure the doors were locked unless he hadn't told the new preacher to do so. Creaking open, I turned on my phone and shone its light ahead. That's where I found him, hanging from one of the rafters, his tie knotted around a rope. I was devastated. All of those plans we had, all those imagined weddings, children, and a white picket fence, all evaporated into one moment. Now all there was was an empty seat opposite me in Starbucks. The coroner ruled it a suicide, and at first I believed it the same. Sean was distraught over his father's death, he had blamed himself, so suicide had made sense. Thing is, though, my story doesn't end there. It would be better if it did, but it does not. One night, I was particularly upset, looking through old photos of us together, remembering his smile, his jokes, and the way he used to ruffle my hair and mess it up, just because it made him laugh to see me fretting. I longed to run my fingers through that short, fiery red hair once more, and I begged God to bring him back to me. Of course he didn't, so I sat in my sorrow, wishing and wishing. And just as the tears were ready to fall from my eyes, I heard it. Thump, thump, thump! I jumped up from my bed with fright. It was nearly midnight. Why would somebody be knocking at my door at this time? I thought to myself. Thump, thump, thump! The knocks came again, this time quicker and more urgent. Throwing my duvet from me, I scrambled downstairs to the door. My parents were sound asleep, my father snoring so loudly it drowned out all other ambient sounds. So, you know, if it were a murderer or a burglar politely announcing their arrival, I'd be done for. Peeling back the wooden barrier, I looked out through the screen door and fell back. Words could not leave my lips. In fact, it was like the air had been stripped from my lungs. Before me, behind that transparent netting, was Sean. He looked exactly the same as he had done the day of his death. The same clothes and the same waxed up hairstyle. Only he was translucent, a sort of white with a neon turquoise tint to him. I've missed you, he exclaimed, as though it was nothing strange about this reunion. 
I didn't speak. I didn't know what to do. He was there in front of me. My boyfriend. The same guy who would always jab ice cream on my nose whenever we got cones from a parlor down the road. Yeah, he was still dead. How, how is this possible? You, you, you were... You were dead! I yelped. My eyes fixed upon the ligature bruise that wrapped itself around his neck like a coil of python. I was, and now I'm back, Sean spoke, his voice haunted and rattling, not at all how I remembered it to sound. Part of me wanted to pull the screen door back off its hinges and embrace the boy who had spent hours in my backyard stargazing with me. However, my hand reached for the handle of the door, and I stopped it. This, no matter how nice it was, no matter how lovely it would be to believe, this was not right. I had wished for his return. That much is true, but I sensed God had no hand in my boyfriend's resurrection. I knew it. In my core, people don't come back, and if they did, I doubt they come back for a friendly chat. Why, why have you come here? I asked, my voice trembling with every word. For you. I want you to join me. Sean smiled as though he was offering to take me out somewhere nice. Blood ran from my face, whilst my head spun with confusion and fear. But you're dead. You want me to kill myself? I snapped in a hushed tone, trying not to wake my parents. It's not so bad. Like going to sleep, really. Aren't you tired? Aren't you lonely? Don't you ache as I ache? Come join me. Be with me. Sean whispered, his words hissing like a snake, rearing to strike. I missed him, and I ached that much. But life, my life is mine, and an instinctive urge to push on and survive kicked in. What are you saying? I yelled, my voice startling his composed pale complexion. You could make a rope with your bed sheets, or turn on the gas and go to sleep. There's pills in the medicine cabinet, bleach in the cupboard beneath the sink. Or there's always a good old-fashioned hot bath and some blades. You could put on our song, light some candles, and just drift away into my arms, Sean suggested. I... I went to speak. I didn't know what to say. I was confused. My head was spinning. And my heart drowning in woes. Why would my boyfriend ask me to kill myself? That wasn't him. He would never. He would want me to be happy and to go on. Don't you want to join me? Don't you love me? If you love me, you'd do it. He snapped, his voice more urgent than before. If you loved me, you wouldn't ask this. In fact, if you were Sean, the Sean I knew, you wouldn't ever want me to end my life. I shouted back, my fearful voice ripping from me in a defiant retort. This did not please him, and his face became a scare. A tortured image of a bug-eaten flesh, and he let loose his wraith scream before suddenly composing himself and returning to the image of the Sean I buried. He's going to take you, you know. He'll take everyone in this stupid little town. And when he does, I won't be waiting for you. Do it now. Join me now. And through him, we shall live together forever. Sean Spectre declared as though he was selling a used car, rather than suicide. Whatever you are, whatever emotional tie brought you here, consider it severed. I won't be joining you. Not. Ever. I cried and slammed the door shut. The sound was loud enough to wake my parents up, who frantically called out, wondering what was going on. But I didn't hear them, for all I could hear was Sean. I see you're still not ready. Perhaps in time you'll change your mind, Sean said, his voice penetrating the wood of my door. Looking through the peephole, I watched as he wandered onto the road, turning to wave goodbye before vanishing into the wind. Sean didn't visit me again. But peculiar things began to happen elsewhere in town. For one, all that summer sun was swallowed but by a constant dreary overcast veil. Rain like we've never had it before blanketed the town, drowning it with an icy cold misery, a good reflection of the mood and those who remained behind. The only time it didn't rain was at night, which was strange looking back. Perhaps I should have known then what was happening in my town. Adding to the bizarre weather was the unexpected decline of life. Machinery was maiming people, folks passing in the street killing over. Even mean old man Wilkes, who by everyone's account was the hardiest, 
coffin dodger in the world was found dead in his yard, having had an accident with a lawnmower. It didn't end there either. A couple of the girls in school made the loyal obituaries as well, taking part in some horrific suicide pact, which in turn seemed to lead their parents to do the same. We were reeling in town, but things were happening so quickly. Swiftly, my small town shrunk and shrunk, shrinking so fast, in fact, that the news wasn't even quick enough to report it. And when it did, most of the deaths were signed off as related to this pandemic. Speaking of COVID, things only got worse during the lockdown. The suicides and the deaths rocketed. People were blaming the isolation, refusing to wear masks or social distance, effectively becoming infected and dying. I feared that soon. I'd be the last man alive in this silly little town, where previously nothing bad ever happened. Everyone's tempers flared, with people blaming the government, China, 5G, or protesters. But I swear, it was that strange preacher who came into town. My concerns only intensified after the death of Mr. Taylor, the ice cream man. I was walking along the street when I saw him cross the road. Out of nowhere, a car, not properly parked, rolled down the hill and crashed into him. It was horrendous and people were quick to gather around. Standing among the observers of the incident was the strange preacher man. You might be thinking, why did I suspect him? There were other observers there too. That is true, but he was the only one smirking at the grisly sign. Then there was Pete Butcher, a rather vocal man who disapproved of the stranger's preachings calling them blasphemous. The following day, he was found, cold and blue, his eyes glassy and dead, heart attack apparently. I tried to check the news to see if anyone was reporting this phenomenon outside of town, if anyone had noticed, but they hadn't. It was odd. It was as if someone was making sure the information didn't get out. The days that followed saw us return to the church again, our congregation shrinking, Radically. One time in particular stands out. We were there to bury Sean's mother. I guess Sean had come to her with the same offer. Only unlike me, she accepted it. As I sat in the church with my parents at either side of me, I looked at the grinning man who appeared to have completely unspurred the reverend's position. The dead are not gone. They live in us. They will always be there for you. You just have to welcome them. Let them in. Let death not be the end. God does not want it to be so. If you want to join them, you join them. If you want to stay, you stay. It is not that absolute definition of free will. We are not to judge Alice, a mother and a widow who felt she could no longer go on without her husband and son. The preacher spoke with words bordering on heretical. To my horror, people began crying out amen and clapping frantically. The church was almost entirely under his sway. Their glazed over looks and empty emotionally drained vessels were just flocking to him. This is wrong, I spoke out, causing everyone in the church to gasp. The preacher's face widened with amusement and unnerved me back into silence. Now, let's let the boy speak, the preacher exclaimed, eager to hear my words. God doesn't want you to die. He doesn't want you to kill yourselves, nor would our loved ones. I declared, trying to counter his vile teachings. I never said such things. That's an interpretation. All I said was if a person chooses to leave us, then we should feel not to judge. If a person wants to leave, they should feel welcome to do so, he exclaimed, and the room clapped. Disgusted and horrified, I fled from the church, seeking refuge from Sean's grave. I sat there for hours, sat there until the service ended, and Sean's mother was laid to rest beside him. Still, I didn't leave. I missed Sean. If he was here, the real him, and not the spectral version, he would believe me. He would know what to do. I must have gotten lost in thought. Either that, or the days were going short. For suddenly I found myself sitting in the darkness of night. The only source of light was a flickering glow emanating from the glass eyes of the church. I heard what sounded like weeping and hushed but audible talking coming from the chapel. It was the Abernathys, both Mr. and Mrs. Abernathy, and their three kids. Mrs. Abernathy had 
recently been diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer, and the whole thing had taken its toll on them. So seeing them in church possibly seeking guidance or prayer wouldn't be odd. However, they were not seeking either of those things, and said they sat, kneeling in a circle, with empty booze bottles and pills. They were smiling, crying, and looking up at the preacher who circled them like a hungry shark. Flickering light from the candles in the room caught his face and for a moment, a split second, a glimpse of what he was, a charade of a man, something devoid of an essence of life, something inhuman. His corpsely head creaked as it twisted around to the window, his maggot white face meeting mine. Then he raised his bony finger, each joint in the limb cracking, as he motioned it up in front of his lips and ushered a whistling hush. Falling back from the window, I fled from the man and his ghastly grin. I never told anyone what I had seen, worried that their warped loyalty to him would turn them on me should I speak out. However, the following day, when Abernathy's were discovered in their home dead from an overdose, I found I could not stay silent. Still my pleas and worries fell on deaf ears. Even the sheriff, a longtime friend of my father's, did not take my complaint seriously saying that with everything going on, he didn't have the time to chase rumors and suspicions. Defeated and feeling more alone than ever, I returned to my home. To utter horror, I found the garage spewing out choking fumes. I tried to open it, but couldn't. So I called the sheriff. He and a couple of the neighbors ripped the door up and revealed my father. He had suffocated himself. A hose was attached to the exhaust and pushed through the window of his car. By his side was a bunch of overdue bills, which he had obviously been keeping a secret from us, in a letter that spoke about joining his father who had died many years ago. Even the sheriff was not immune to the fatal phenomenon occurring across the town. For shortly after retrieving my father, they found his car careened off the road after sending a text to his daughter saying he was sorry about her mother. I couldn't fathom what was happening. I knew it was the preacher man. I knew he wasn't human and I had no way to stop him or get help. Do you know what that feels like? The utter isolating powerlessness? To know no way of escaping or fighting back? To know nothing protected you, and any false move would spell an end. That is what I felt. On the final night of this saga, my mother, newly widowed, was drinking heavily, and I could count on my hands the amount of people still left in the town. That night was different from the others. For around midnight, the street became illuminated, not by lampposts, but as spectral white forms of all of those who had died. Not just recently, either. Every long-dead family member, all those the town had forgotten from its history, rose and walked for once more. Puritans, natives, and Confederate soldiers, peasants, drowned witches, and many others, all wandered the road. This mortuary parade made its way through the town and its streets, with the dead knocking on each and every door, tempting others to join them. Some did, their spirits emerging from their homes moments later, and joining the legions of the deceased. That's when I noticed it. My mother's whimpering had stopped, her drunken sobbing silenced completely. I knew. I knew what she had done. Before I even opened the bathroom door, I found her body in the tub. Her spirit rose from the watery grave passing through me as she made her way down the stairs and through the front door onto the street. I saw them, my parents, Sean, all the taken were there in a parade, and out of desperation rather than bravery, I rushed after them. He was there, the preacher. Charging out into the street, I confronted him. He was humming a tune and waving an old-fashioned sickle, as though he was a conductor of a musical orchestra. Then he turned that wicked man and strolled alongside his ghostly forces, making his way towards me with great eagerness. God was his human disguise, and my heart thumped and damn near stopped when I saw him. Whatever fiendish horror he was, he now proudly announced it. More than withered and gaunt, his face was a ghoulish sight. His bald head was a skull wrapped in mummified flesh, ashen and pallid color. Gone were his eyes, they were now replaced by empty sockets, a pair of abyssal holes bored into his head. His nose was a gash, no more a beak, but rather a triangular tear. I looked at his face, watching as bits flaked off and floating into the air around him, 
The skin of his face still bulged with protruding bones, pushing behind his withered porcelain flesh. One thing remained unchanged. His smile, now entirely lipless, was fixed in a garish, grim grin. Ah, come to join us, have you? There's always a place with us. You are welcome, he said with his gentlemanly patter and preachy southern charm, trying to warm its way into my mind. I, I want you to... I stammered, trying to get the words out. Now that I stood face to hideous face with this truth of a man. I want you to bring them back, I spat, finally released the words that had been locked by fear. Back? As a rule, I don't bring the dead back. For you, though, I might make an exception, but in return, I want you. He sneered, his bones creaking and cracking as he did. Me? I gasped, shocked by his proposal. You've resisted. Your determination, your strive for existence is strong. Imagine how hot my fires would burn if all that will of yours was poured into my ranks, he said as he approached me, looming over me with his skeletal shape. Who, who, who are you? I whimpered, my words inching forward as I inched back, step by careful step. Why, child, don't you know? Grinned the preacher. You've read the stories. Heard my name in the wailing of widows and the ache of the lost love. I was there at your birth, a shadow always near. I, I, I don't... I hesitated, stopping where I stood. I looked at his hideous form and felt all courage and will siphoned out of me and into him. I knew now who he was and the truth. That solitary realization filled me with a type of absolute terrible dread. I looked... And behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name I recited, only to halt at the last word, too afraid to acknowledge it. Death, the preacher interjected. Lightning flashed, and for a second the man's already frightening face was unmasked further, unveiling a towering, shrouding vestige, an antesis of life. I am the pale rider, the reaper, and the boatman. I am the most grim, the cold bite of the winter, and the shine on the executioner's axe. I am Wither, Decay, and the Twilight. Many names and many titles, too many to recount. But for now, my necromantic majesty is content to be referred to as Death, he declared, even going as far as to bow his head, as though it was a formal introduction. Shadows stretched out from him, and the night itself became eclipsed, the air in my lungs froze solid and my heart could beat any faster. I stumbled back, afraid and terrified as the freezing presence of his dark intentions enveloped me. Give yourself to me, child. Take my hand and walk with me, death beckoned. If you're death, then why not just take me? You did it to the others, I questioned, continued to edge away from the figure as he crept closer. Because there's rules. There's a balance. For now, at least, grimmed the Reaper. Why not just make something happen, an accident like it did with Sean's dad? I spoke, my words wobbling with worry and apprehension at his reply. You want parlor tricks? I can nudge a car at the right direction, summon the wind and knock you off your balance. But where would be the artistry in that? I prefer the subtle approach. The sweet satisfaction of a total domination over another's will, he hissed. But there's something else that isn't there. You can't do that. My soul won't go to you if you do it that way. That's why you haven't, I retorted. Finally, the petty had dropped. For a moment, that grim diminished upon the preacher's face. As I said, there are rules that bind my hands. For instance, your town's sheriff and his desire to escape the guilt of murdering his wife that allowed me to brush him aside, as if he were dust on my shoulder. Your father with his secret debt weighing heavy on his soul, and your mother's newly widowed status were all I needed to whisper to them, to reach out and touch their minds. Others, however, like yourself, can resist my influence. For now, he admitted with his tone annoyed and bitter, so you're weak, I said, suddenly finding a false sense of confidence. I am nothing of the sort, 
he bellowed with his voice causing thunder to roll through the clouds above. I am not at my full strength. This much is true. But I can still summon a storm and shroud the sun. And, when I am, return to my full potential. I will be able to stride across the lands. I'll be able to snuff out anyone and everyone I choose, like a blowing out a candle. Alas, I'm a little bit rusty and a bit groggy. You see, my brothers and I have just awoken. I sense they too are about, and having their own fun. Brothers? I anxiously asked. Oh yes, the others are here. The seals have been broken. The end has come, my sweet simple Simeon. You should give up now before the real show kicks off, he suggested, his words luring like a luminous bulb of anglerfish. I found my feet draw closer to him, my head swimming with fears and doubts, with desire for everything to just stop, to rest. But then I stopped myself, pulling away and edging back. No! I gasped. No! You would deny me? He smirked, amused by my impertinence. Come now, aren't you tired? You fought so hard, and you've done brilliantly. Why not give in now? Be united with those you've loved and lost, he preached, selling his utopia vision of deathless sleep. His words tugged and pulled, reminding me of childhood memories. They summoned images in my mind's eye of mine and Sean's first kiss. It was cruel. It was intoxicating. But it was effective. I found myself drifting into that sea of pleasantries and wonderful sights, drowning in my longing and deepest wishes. Come, be with us, the preacher whispered, his voice now disappearing and being replaced by those of Sean and my parents. No! I snapped, only waking up just in time to recoil my hand, which was frighteningly close to his. You said it yourself, you're not strong enough to take me by force, I snapped. True, but after a couple of towns have fallen, given themselves to my service, I will be able to raise more than a few ghosts. My reach will extend from one end of the globe to the other, and all within it shall feel my touch. Now come with me, he ordered. No, you're still not getting me, I said as I backed up, afraid, but relentlessly gripping hold of the only thing I had left. What if I sweetened the pot, and offered you and the one you loved freedom from my service? After the time of tribulation, of course. The preacher proposed, biding my life as though it was an eBay listing. The answer will still be no. Fine, final offer now. I could bring back your parents, reunite you with your lost love, and for you not only from my service, but return you all back to the life after your contract with me has ended, he bartered, almost begging me to take his hand. Now I saw him for what he was. He wasn't just a reaper, he was a salesman. This was his last pitch, and though death may promise all, I knew it would deliver nothing. His words were hollow as his eyes and as empty as his heart. Never, you cannot have me or my life. I, well, I won't be joining you. I trembled on my words, worried what his next reaction would be. I was right to fear him. Never, never, I am not some door-to-door -door sales boy, he roared, his form shattering like smoke as the great giant apparition appeared in his place. I am death. No one can resist me, nor ignore my call. Join me now, or I will visit upon you. Haunts and terrors like ones you've never seen before. I will drag you to the void beyond and let you gaze into the godless maw until your mind unravels. I will make you suffer, make you hurt, make you wish your life away. But wouldn't you rather have peace? All of that suffering? I offer you everything, your lost love, another life, and peace eternal. What is your answer? Boomed a specter of dead and decay. Frightened, I fell back, crawling along the ground as the grand skeleton form, with its grim hood and Sith looming over me. I said no, I yelled out. Then suddenly the dire visage of the grim reaper dispersed, reforming before me as a skeletal and mummified preacher. Damn, I really wanted you. Oh well, shame, but I suppose you'll come to me eventually. All of you come to me in the end. And if I'm anything, I am patient. 
He smiled and tipped his hat and turned away from me. Wait! Bring them back! Please bring them back! I begged as I fell to my knees. Ignoring my pleas, he and his ghostly flock marched on. That's when it appeared. A steed ghostly and silent, made of ethereal wisps and webs of white spiritual threads. It swirled up from beneath death, who sat upon it, and became the image that all good Christians know to dread. He was death, decay and destruction incarnate, unflinching and merciless. He offered nothing and take everything, and now he walks among us. Atop his pale horse, the rider of his legions of ghostly specters rode up into the night sky, onward to sell their grave reunions and promises to others. That's why I wrote this, to warn the world. COVID and all other misery we're seeing, that's nothing compared to what comes next. Check your town's death rates, monitor the suicides, and if a strange preacher comes to visit, if death seems to follow in his wake, then whatever you do, you must resist. Resist with all your might. Listen not to those he sends to collect you. They are not the ones you loved, not anymore. They are his now, succumbed by his grim influence, enthralled and bound for eternity. He can't take us all, not yet, but it's only a matter of time. So this is important. This you must remember. If you feel desperate, if you feel alone, or you're missing a loved one, do not give in to death's siren call. Life is all, and he will stop at nothing to claim it.